Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed with the interactive dialogue on the report of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, submitted pursuant to Council Resolution 40-1, entitled Promoting Reconciliation, Accountability and Human Rights in Sri Lanka. It is my honour to welcome Ms. Michelle Bachelet, High Commissioner for Human Rights, who will pre present a report by video message, and Ms. Nada al nashif Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights, who is with us here in the Assembly Hall. The list of speakers will close in 15 minutes. Madam High Commissioner, you have the floor. Madam President, this is a key juncture for the Council's engagement with Sri Lanka. As my report, A slash high chair C slash 46 slash 20 indicates, nearly 12 years after the end of the armed conflict, domestic initiatives have repeatedly failed to ensure justice for victims and promote reconciliation. Despite commitments made in 2015, the current government, like its predecessor, has failed to pursue genuine truth speaking or accountability processes. The impact on thousands of survivors from all communities is devastating. Moreover, the systems, structures, policies, and personnel that gave rise to such grave violations in the past remain and have recently been reinforced. Addressing grievances and redressing past uh, violations are critical prevention tools at the core of the Council's work. Our report highlights disturbing trends over the past year, which warn of a seriously deterioration in key areas. The space for civil society and independent media, which has grown significantly, is now rapidly shrinking. The independence of the judiciary, the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka, the National Police Commission, and other key bodies has been deeply eroded by the recently adopted 20th Constitutional Amendment. The growing militarization of key civilian functions is encroaching on democratic governance. The continued failure to implement comprehensive reforms or to vet personnel leaves in place security and military officers who have been implicated in alleged grave crimes and violations. Tamil and Muslim minorities are being excluded by divisive and discriminatory rhetoric, including from the highest state officials. The policy of forced cremation of COVID-19 victims has caused pain and distress to the minority Muslim and Christian communities. In other words, long-standing structural and systemic issues persist in Sri Lanka, and now there are clear warning signs that past patterns of violation could be repeated. Madam President, successive uh, government commissions have failed to credibly establish truth and ensure accountability. Indeed, the government has obstructed investigations and judicial proceedings into emblematic human rights cases. The latest Commission of Inquiry, appointed in January 2021 to review the findings of previous commissions, promises to repeat the cycle without meaningful results. By repeatedly failing to advance accountability for past human rights violations committed, and by withdrawing its support for the Council's Resolution 30-1 and related measures, the government has largely closed the door on the possibility of genuine progress to end impunity through a national process. For this reason, I call on the Council to explore new ways to advance various types of accountability at the international level for all parties and seek redress for victims, including by supporting a dedicated capacity to collect and preserve evidence and information for the future accountability processes as well as to support relevant judicial proceedings in member states. My office stands ready to continue monitoring the human rights situation, including progress towards accountability and reconciliation. I thank you very much, High Commissioner. And um, as is our practice, we shall start by hearing um, the delegation of the country uh, concerned. And the list of speakers will close uh, in 15 minutes. 
Uh, I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Sri Lanka. You have five minutes. Madam President, Madam High Commissioner, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the OHCHR report which is presented today emanates from the resolution 30 stroke 1 and 40 stroke 1 from which the government of Sri Lanka announced its withdrawal of co-sponsorship at the 43rd session of this council last year. Sri Lanka rejects High Commissioner's report which is unjustifiably broadened its scope and mandated further, incorporating many issues of governance and matters that are essentially domestic for any self-respecting sovereign country. This is incomplete violation of Article 2.7 of the Charter of the UN that states, nothing contained in the present Charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. The trajectory that has emerged with regard to the recommendations and conclusions reflects the preconceived, politicized and prejudicial agenda which as certain elements have relentlessly pursued against Sri Lanka. These recommendations are based on ill-founded allegations. Sri Lanka categorically rejects the conclusions and recommendations in the High Commissioner's report. The call for asset freezes, travel bans, reference to uh, ICC and the exercise of universal jurisdiction by the individual states based on evidence that up to date has been denied access to and retained by the High Commissioner's office with some of it on released for 30 years, particularly in relation to a country like Sri Lanka, which has consistently and constructively engaged with the UN and its mechanism, points to distinct and eminent danger, which is the international community as a whole need to take off. Such unilateral actions by certain countries are unacceptable and a violation of the principles of natural justice. In addition to the progress made since last March, Sri Lanka has provided written comments and instances of erroneous information, misconceived and arbitrary assessments in the report. It is regrettable that the High Commission's office published its report, accompanied by an unprecedented propaganda campaign on it, and refused to publish our comments on the report as an addendum. This has deprived Sri Lanka and members of equal visibility of Sri Lanka's views on the report. Sri Lanka refutes the allegations that have been reproduced in the High Commissioner's report from the highly contentious report of the panel of experts on accountability and the report of the High Commission's office investigation on Sri Lanka, which have been rejected by Sri Lanka for reasons explained to this council before. The contents of the report, which have been drawn from the said disputed reports, are rife and factual inaccuracies that appear to equate atrocities committed by the LTT, a terrorist organization proscribed internationally with a legitimate action taken by the government to safeguard the territorial integrity of the country and the right to life of our people. Madam President, Insistence on ever expanding externally driven prescriptions, notwithstanding our continuous cooperation and engagement with the Council and the UN bodies, can pose numerous challenges and such processes could set a dangerous precedent affecting all member states of the UN. We regret the disproportionate attention drawn to Sri Lanka by this Council, driven by political motivation. Sri Lanka calls upon the members of this Council that any resolution which is based on this report be rejected by the Council and be brought to a closure. In conclusion, we remain open to engaging constructively with the UN, including this Council and the international community in mutually agreed areas in conformity with the Constitution and in keeping with the domestic priorities and policies. I bond. I thank you very much, and I'll inform you that the list of speakers is now closed. 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of this meeting. We will reconvene tomorrow at 10 a.m. to continue the interactive dialogue on the report of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on promoting reconciliation, accountability and human rights in Sri Lanka, followed by the interactive dialogue on the promotion of, uh, and protection of human rights in Nicaragua. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I understand that certain delegations have requested to exercise the right of reply. And I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Israel. And you have three minutes. The floor is yours. Hello. Okay. Israel would like to exercise the right of reply with regard to the statement made by Iran, Syria and Lebanon under the accountability item. It is regrettable that many of the countries that spoke are only using this platform to further politicize the Human Rights Council and attack Israel. I would recommend instead of focusing on Israel, these countries look closer to home and focus on the human rights of their own people and pursue accountability for human rights violations carried out on behalf of their own governments. Madam President, it is absurd that the representative of Syria and Iran pretend to be in a position to speak to us about human rights at all. They are both responsible for 10 years of bloodshed in Syria, which has claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. In addition, while the Iranian delegate come here to promote their inflammatory rhetoric freely, the people of Iran are deprived of their basic political freedoms of speech and peaceful assembly. Perhaps, the, perhaps, perhaps Iran should pursue accountability for all women, youth, journalists, NGOs, LGBTQI people, members of minority groups and members of the opposition whose rights are systematically violated in Iran and by Iran throughout the region. Madam Vice President, with regard to Lebanon, speaking at an interactive dialogue and accountability, while they allow Hezbollah, a terrorist organization, to roam free and hold the entire state of Lebanon hostage to its radical and destruction is deplorable. An important part of Hezbollah's strategy is to use the local population as human shields, putting the illegitimate interests of Iran before the people of Lebanon. I would recommend that the Leb Lebanon Focus accountability for its own citizens under Hezbollah's control. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I thank you, and I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Ethiopia. Thank you, Madam Vice President. As some of the allegations are totally aligned to, aligned to us, Ethiopia would like to exercise its right of reply and uh, will focus on the situation of Eritrean refugees. Ethiopia's important role as the host to a million of refugees is well recognized. We also take our international obligations under applicable international treaties and conventions very seriously. We are, of course, cognizant of the concerns raised on the situation of Eritrean refugees, including the shortage of food supplies in the camps, as well as unconfirmed reports of attacks, abductions, and forced recruitment of Eritrean refugees. These issues were discussed during the recent visit of the High Commissioner for Refugees, Mr. Filippo Grandi, visited the camps and talked to the refugees themselves on some of their concerns. The truth of the matter is that the refugees had faced shortages of food and other supplies. They also felt insecure for their safety. Therefore, measures have already been undertaken to address their concerns. It is, of course, regrettable that the office in Shere that is coordinating the four refugee camps hosting Eritrean refugees in the region was looted and vandalized by the TPLF. This was done with the, whole, with the sole intention of tarnishing Ethiopia's image as a host to more than a million refugees, including the hundreds of thousands of Eritreans. Some of the staffs working in the office were detained by TPLF, while others were dispersed into different cities and towns, fearing for their safety and security. 
Therefore, efforts have been made to bring those who com committed crimes to account, resume services in the office, start humanitarian assistance, including delivery of food and non-food items to the refugees, help restore their normal life in the camp and in the host communities. It should be noted that among the total Eritrean refugees in Tigray, 75% of them are sheltered in Adi Harush and Mayaini camps, and they are getting the necessary supply in time. Only 19,000 Eritrean refugees were in Shimalba and his other refugee camps, out of whom the government has created active contact with more than 10,000 of them. This does not mean that the remaining have vanished or forcibly returned to their country, as some have claimed. They can be identified with their electronic identity cards, and more than 300 are reporting per day. Many of them are dispersed in different parts of the country. The location of Shimal Bar camp is only 20 kilometers away from the border where the Eritrea had been contested. In accordance with the international standard, it should be relocated at least 50 kilometers away from the border of the country of origin. On the other hand, the Isas camp is located in an area that is inhospitable. That is why the Ethiopian government was trying to relocate the refugee in these two camps to another area had it not been for the TPLF refusal. It is, of course, extremely regrettable that these two camps are destroyed. Some of these refugees hosted in these camps have now been relocated to the remaining two camps, while the others dispersed in Addis Ababa, Tigray, and Amara regions. Therefore, we want to take this opportunity to reaffirm to this Council that Ethiopia will not shirk its responsibilities to refugees. The work that is being I carried out... I thank you very to much. Your time is up. And I will give the floor to the distinguished representative of Iran. Thank you, Madam, Madam Vice President. The person representing the most evil actor in the world repeated today some absurd allegations against Iran and those who are fighting its terrorist proxies in Syria. The regime that is best characterized under UN General Assembly Resolution 3379 of 10 November 1975 has no moral ground to talk about the lofty concept of human rights. Shame is too light a word to describe the brutal character of this infamous regime that has long been the single most horrendous source of insecurity, terror, bloodshed, hatred, and aggression in the West Asia. Iran and its brave heroes have been the most effective force against Daesh terrorism. The same scourge that the Israeli regime has long been supporting as its favorite cult for generating terror and destroying countries in the region. The fact that Daesh and the Israeli criminal officials were the only and the first to celebrate U.S. criminal act of assassination of General Ghassan Soleimani, who was the staunchest fighter against terrorism, tells everything about the dirty alliance between the Israel warlords and Daesh terrorists. The Islamic Republic of Iran has helped the legitimate government of Syria at its request to combat terrorism. The martyr General Soleimani and his companions will always be remembered as true champions of human rights and dignity of the peace-loving nation of Syria. I thank you, Madam President. I thank you very much, and I would like to call on everyone to adhere to language that is commensurate with the dignity inherent to the discussions on human rights issues. And I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Syria. Can you hear me, madam? I can hear you. Okay. Shukran, Sayyida Naid al-Rais. Thank you, madam uh, vice uh, president. I would like to comment on what has been said by the representative of the Israeli occupation at uh, the council by drawing attention uh, and distracting attention from the report under discussion, which has to do with the impunity of Israel 
uh, after years, long years of occupation of the Palestinian territories and the Golan Heights through discriminatory practices uh, that violate uh, principles of international law and, as, and, uh, and against all resolutions of all the United Nations. Uh, Madam Vice President, the Israeli occupation has no legal grounds or ethical grounds uh, as to speak about uh, Syria after the um, Israeli after the Israeli occupation of the Gol Golan Heights, those attempts to by the occupation authority and to distract attention from the subject matter of this important report are completely uh, rejected. Any illusions or any uh, measures uh, uh, propagated by uh, the uh, occupation authority are completely rejected. And we call upon you to focus on uh, ending uh, the violations of human rights in uh, the of uh, Syrians in the Golan Heights and uh, in Palestine and in order to achieve and uh, to implement uh, the UN resolutions. He has uh, no moral, moral uh, grounds <clears throat> or legal grounds uh, to speak in such a way. At any rate, we will deal with these violations according to Chapter 7 and upon the reports that will be submitted on this point. I thank you, Madam Vice President. I thank you, and I would like to ask if any other delegation would like to make use of the right of reply at this point. No, I don't think that is the case. In that case, I hereby close the ninth meeting of the 46th session of the Human Rights Council.